Well, I had originally been my intention to continue on with my uh, series on abundance, but I, f I felt like I needed a little more time to, to, I wanted to be able to do the text justice. And uh, as I was uh, preparing it this last week, this, this text stuck out to me, and I ended up getting more from this than I did in what I was, so I wanted to just follow the leading of the Spirit, not force it, because I know, you know, if he's showing me something, I want to I wanna go ahead and, and heed to that. So uh, it's uh, uh, Romans 8, 1 through 2, and I also want to reference back to uh, Romans 7. I want to make a comparison to these two texts where he says, There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. And in Romans 7, he says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Now, I have in t times past spoken a considerable amount about this, this, this law that we find within our members, and which we find that no matter how much we would like it not to be there, there's a sense in which uh, evil is always present with us as we reside in this body. And, and as I was thinking about it this last week, I was able to see more than I have before how even though this law is still present within every one of us, it doesn't exist in the way that it used to before we came into Christ. It's, uh, we're not subject anymore to the law of sin and death. We're free from the law of sin and death. We're subject to the law of sin, but that's different. That is a different thing. They're, they're, they're the same law in the sense of Genesis. It's, it has something to do with your old nature, with your body, but we're not subject to it anymore. It, 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 it's a, a force that, it's work at, that is at work in us, and we recognize it, but we're not, that's not the dominating law that we're living by now. So there is therefore now no condemnation. First of all, we notice that he doesn't just say there is therefore now no condemnation at all for anybody. It, that's, that's not what he's talking about. This is a continuation of the reasoning that he laid down in the previous chapter, uh, especially at the end of it, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, this is an exclusive group that we're talking about. And we also notice, too, that about the way that he says it. He doesn't say, those who have received you know, forgiveness from Jesus have no more condemnation. And that's true. But those who are in Christ Jesus. See, the provision of salvation, all the things, the benefits that we have, we can't receive these things outside of Christ himself. Yeah. And salvation, Christ is the provision. Yeah. Uh, Jesus has taken away sin from the face of God. We recognize this. And he's paid for the sins of the whole world. But this, those who, only those who avail themselves of this provision are going to be able to partake of the benefits of this. There really is no impersonal means of obtaining the benefits of, of, that are realized by those who are in Christ. Amen. So we, we have to be buried into his death. We have to partake of, of dying to ourselves. And, and we have to be raised according to his very resurrection life to be able to walk, walk acceptably to God. Now, this is the way that he's designed it. This is, it's, it's a union, this divine connection. You're actually becoming part of Christ, and he's becoming part of you. And he is the vine. So, so only as you are a branch in that vine are you going to be able to bear fruit. So he is the bread of life, and, and only as you partake of that bread and eat it and make it a part of you are you going to be able to have that nourishment that's ministered there. See, uh... Uh, you must abide in Christ. He continues on with this. He says, Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. See, this, this is a point of distinction. This is the way that those who are in Christ are known. They don't walk after the flesh. They walk after the Spirit. Uh, he says this a, a different way in Galatians. Same, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. They, they have... So whenever we have those who are professing the name of Christ, and who, yet it's evident that they're not walking in the Spirit. And it's evident that they're not separating themselves from the world and, and that, that they're not even thinking about involving themselves in these things and adopting the world's identity and the world's mannerisms. There's something wrong. I, either they're not in Christ or they have forsaken the way in which they have been set. And, and, and we shouldn't 
Uh, be tolerant of this thing, of people who are in this category. We should expect those who are in Christ to act like it. Really. I mean, we should expect those who are in Christ Jesus to be separate from the world, to be holy, because that is what Christ is doing. That is what he has revealed. And for us to be accepting of, of, of this condition, we're, we're basically making God a liar. It's a very serious thing. And I, I thought about this. It, well, we've been put on this highway of holiness. You know, th- it is a straight and a narrow way. And I, I found this out when I was younger uh, in my days of disobedience. I had um, uh, gone on a trip and I just went walking and went, I took a bus and w- w- got whatever ride I could. And I found out that there are some roads that you can't walk on. It's actually illegal for you to walk on that road because it's so narrow and there's not a whole lot of room on either side of the road and it's, it's designed for very fast cars to be driven on. So you're not allowed on that road. If you're on that road, the police will take you and, and take you somewhere else because it's dangerous for you to be on that road. It's the same way in Christ Jesus. This is designed for those who are walking in the Spirit who can stay on that narrow way. Flesh can't walk this road. It's not designed for them. So then, now, um, uh, he says, I find a law then, that what I would do good, evil is present with me. See, the the apostle brings this up in the seventh chapter. I want to tie this to what we were just talking about. He says, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin that is in my members. Um... I wanted to just take a second as I was looking at this for those who enthusiastically embrace a multitude of translations to to look at this text because there has been some serious perversion of this text that has actually made Paul a liar. It's made him contradictory to what he said in the 6th chapter and what he said in the 8th chapter, and that is that we are free from the law of sin and death. We really are. We have died with Christ. We have died to ourselves and to sin, and it's not the dominant nature anymore. Um, now this is something that has to be clarified. For those who, who have little understanding, I can imagine that if this is the only Bible that you owned, it would be very, very confusing. Because he says, and this is the New Living Translation in Romans 6, he says, We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so sin might lose its power in our lives. I can say amen to that. That's good. And, and in uh, Romans Eight, he says, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God, and it never did obey his God laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But then in Romans 7, he says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do is what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. That's not what he's saying. That's in complete contradiction to what he just said. He said, there's another power within me that's at war with my mind, and this power makes me a slave to the sin that's still within me. That is not what he is saying at all. Uh, those who view the seventh chapter of Romans as saying this, they have made Paul a liar. And this, this really is not contradictory. What Paul is really saying in this text is not contradictory to what he's just going to say in, in Romans 8. Uh, th- this captivity that he speaks of, it's like a principle. It's, it's something that he cannot escape from. And that sense, he's captive to it. That when he desires to do good, there's always a part of him that fights against it. E- even in this verse, he, he says this statement. He makes this separation. And the other versions kind of omit this. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's the difference. He, he, he says, when he says it, he says, in my members. I find this law in my members, but that's not me anymore. Well, and, and well, the way that they translated it was, I love the law of God with all of my heart. Well, that just sounds like a bunch of sentimental, wishy-washy, I don't even know what he's saying there. Because it's a, it's a new heart and a new mind. That's the reason why we love God's laws. We really do. Those who say, I love the law of God with all of my heart, but I can't stop sinning, they're just lying is what it is. Because the heart of man is desperately wicked in its natural state. You can't love God with your natural heart. And that's, that's the reason why they've, con- they've confused this. They've, they don't understand what it's saying, so they translated it to something that's not even what he's saying. 
So um, I can see if you looked at it, even in the King James Version, where he says that I'm captive to the law of sin, but then in the next chapter he says, I'm free from the law of sin and death. And the reason why there can be a distinction here is that in Christ we've been given a new mind. We've been given partakers to be partakers of the divine nature. You notice he doesn't say that I, it brings me captive to the law of sin and death. There's, there's a difference there between the law of sin in, Ro, in chapter, Romans chapter 7 and the law of sin and death in the next chapter. See, um, those who are unregenerate, those who are not in Christ, they live as slaves to their nature by the direction of Satan. That's just what they do. They're not even really aware of the fact that that happens, that that's what they do. Their minds are carnal, and so they don't even resist the, su the suggestions of the wicked one. He tells them what to do. Their body drives them to do it. They sin, and the consequence is death. It's this, this law, this principle, sin and death. They're inexorably connected. You can't get away from it. But, but when, when you have this spiritual mind, when you have the ability to be able to understand what Satan is doing and, and the thoughts that he's putting in your head, then even though your body and your flesh had desire to do these things, you can actually over, you can, you can crucify the flesh. You can put your body under. You can let the law of your mind rule over these, these things. That, See, this is the reason why Paul can say that there's therefore now no condemnation. And it's kind of a technical point, but temptation for you is not, it, do, it doesn't condemn you. But actually, those who are in the world, the thoughts that Satan gives them, they do condemn them. Because they agree with them, and they enter into them. It, it, I think that if you could really break it down and look at it, there's a whole lot of things when you were in sin and living in sin that they didn't really have their genesis in you, this, the the thoughts and the things that you entertained and the things that you entered into, but they are going to be, you're going to be judged as if they were because you entered into it, because you agreed wholeheartedly with it. I mean, he says in Romans 6, 6, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. For he is dead, he, he that is dead is freed from sin. If your body is dead, then you don't have to live with that body anymore. It, it, only, it only makes sense. So then he continues on. I wanted to just go in the next two verses in Romans 8. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. The apostle continues, and he, he uh, lays a summary of what he's just expounded in the previous chapter, that there are things, there were things that the law could not do because it was weak through the flesh. He says this in the seventh chapter of Romans, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. Well, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So the, the, the law really couldn't make us walk contrary to the law of sin and death. Uh, we, we were what we were, and no matter what we did outwardly, we couldn't change our nature, uh, who we really were. Now Paul is admitting here that when he received the commandment, the standard of God, even though it was good and holy and just, it actually stimulated his flesh. And, and, and his flesh, in reaction to that standard, waxed worse. It was actually worse for having heard the commandment. He wasn't aware of this until it was brought to light, until he heard the, the law came, thou shalt not covet. And, and uh, the law that which was ordained unto life, he found to be unto death. So then God, see, what the, law, what the law could not do because it was weak to the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now, I'm af uh, this is something that I'm afraid that many people aren't aware of, that the flesh really cannot be um, reformed. It can't be changed. It, it, you can't be dis. You can be the most disciplined person in the world, and you can try and try, and you can even be successful in, in controlling like the overflow of sin. You know, you can stop the outward expression of sin, but the fact that your flesh has the capacity of sin makes it unacceptable, no matter what. Because even if you want to do it and you stop doing it. You can, you can stop doing it for, for the wrong reasons, you know? It, it, it's not enough. It's not enough. 
See, he's, this is in fact not what God is doing in salvation. He hasn't adjusted his own person to accept flesh. And, and he has not gone out on, a, on a, a quest to reform flesh. Christ in his sacrifice condemned sin in the flesh. He, he judged it in a body. And this has always been God's intention. It's, it's part of his nature that he cannot and he will not acquit the guilty in this sense. Uh, I, I remember uh, reading this text in Numbers a long time ago where it's, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty. So, well, wait a minute. If God, if by no means he will clear the guilty, then how is salvation possible? Well, the answer is in the way in which he has saved us. He's not saving who we were. He's saving us from who we were. He has changed us to be acceptable unto him. See, he, he really hasn't cleared the guilty in that sense. The flesh is going to pass away. The earth and the flesh, everything that has been corrupted by the malady of sin, will be judged and be put away at the end of this earth. See, in salvation, Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. It was judging his body on the tree. And in doing this, he actually made a way for us to escape from it, to, be, to have this new man that was made, created in righteousness and true holiness. Amen. Now this is that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now in the gospels when Jesus was asked by the scribes which, which is the greatest commandment? You remember what he said. Um, the law and all of its various requirements can really be boiled down to this. Love the, you know, God with your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. So, in other words, God, the point really wasn't what men did. The point is that God required men to be righteous. If, if a man is truly righteous, then he won't have to have all of these things spelled out for him. Don't do this. Do this. Don't do this. Uh, uh, the righteousness of the law really wasn't about being able to do everything right. It was about being right. Because if you are right, you will do right. So the Pharisees, they were very outwardly righteous. You know, that they were serious about the religion. If, if you looked at them, you couldn't have been able to point out one outwardly, you know, bad thing that they were doing. Uh, but Jesus said, you're full of dead men's bones. So, I mean, it, it wasn't about that. Uh, and uh, the, there were some men under the law who they, they like towered over their peers. We have David. We have uh, all of these other uh, men in the scriptures, even Moses, you know, Abraham before the law. But even they find their acceptance in Christ Jesus. As, as, they were as righteous as they possibly could be in their generations. And they, they did obey God. But even they find their acceptance in Christ Jesus. And no matter who you are and what you do, you will fall short if, if, if it were not for the grace of God and for his, his empowerment. Well, this doesn't mean that we tell men that if, if they, that, you know, well, you can't follow the law. God requires that. God requires obedience. But, but as we look back when we come into Christ, we recognize that this is, it was not by works of righteousness that we have done. It, this was the Lord. He is the one that did this. And... Um, I'm really thankful for the way in which uh, the Apostle has said this in the seventh chapter. It, the distinction in between uh, um, the, the flesh, who you were, and who you are now, that you, you have a change in identity and you have a change in nature. And if you take that to, too far, then you can, if you have a temptation, if you have something within you, think, well, maybe I'm really not saved if I still have this going on within me. But you can recognize really what's going on inside of your body. And uh, that's, that's all that I had this morning, brethren. So I pray that the Lord would. Amen. Thank you.